Rachel Madel from Talking With Tech. And I'm Chris Bouguet from Talking With Tech. We have a podcast dedicated to augmentative and alternative communication, all things related to helping kids with complex communication needs. If you have a passion for helping people with language disabilities, this is the show for you. Each episode features an interview or a roundtable discussion on a topic related to augmentative communication and helping people with language disabilities. And we're really passionate about giving practical strategies to clinicians working in the field who are working with children or adults, anything related to AAC. So you can look us up on iTunes or you can find us on Facebook. We've got a group over there or check out our website at bit.ly slash TWT podcast. Please join our community of professionals that are working to ensure that everyone can say whatever they want to say, however they want to say it. The views and opinions expressed during this show do not necessarily reflect the the policy policy or position of any affiliated workplace or employer. The views and opinions of the show do not constitute recommendations for therapy. Please Please contact contact a licensed SLP for individual consult on your situation. Please listen carefully. What is communication? An essential behavior of life. We have the both blessing and responsibility of trying to foster another. It's the strongest way for two people to convey information to each other. Communication is a lifeline. It's just connection with other people. Connecting people in terms of ideas, thoughts, or needs. Draws us out of ourselves, draws us into that relationship, you know, builds up our families without it being lost. Whatever it is that we do to express intent and achieve an impact. Communication is the ability to express your needs, wants, frustrations, and desires to anyone that you feel needs to have that information. Welcome to Speech Science, episode number 108. We are proud members of the Exceptional Podcast Network. I'm Matt Hot, joined as always from the southern part of my tri-state area, Michelle Wintering. Hi, Matt. See, Kentucky is part of the tri-state of Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky. And from the state that I don't care about because it's the home of the Steelers and the Philadelphia Phillies, Michael McLeod. Home of the Steelers? Yeah, Pittsburgh. I mean, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a little big. Pittsburgh is very far away from here. Is it really? Yeah. Very far. How far far. of a drive is that? Uh, Probably like five, six hours, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Anyone listening west of Chicago is going to laugh at your very far. Right. That's fair. It's a long time for me to drive to Cleveland in four hours. Oh, we are on episode number 108. And on today's episode, we are talking with Ayelet Moranovich from Learn With Less, which is super helpful. Uh, we have parents and therapists at home with very little or no therapy materials, uh, all struggling together. So I figured that would be helpful. Uh, if you missed last week, uh, episode 107, we had Rachel Archambault on as we handled our stress levels. And then Angie Merced talked about burnout. So if you hadn't had a chance to listen to that one yet, uh, click back and listen to 107. But I thought today we would talk about uh, the updates with the FDA and sterilizations of masks, a recent study on paper versus cloth masks, the look at special education and the possibility that our kids may be falling through the cracks, uh, some telepractice success stories, the due process, the SSP pod shout outs, um, also the informed SLP this week. Uh, They are talking about using hearing devices in toddlers, but I thought we'd start off the same way that we always do, and that is we want to hear from you at home. Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com, and from there, you can email us, speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. Give us a phone call or a text, uh, 614-681-1798, and you can also find us on patreon.com slash speechsciencepodcast. Now that we got that all the way, Let's start it around the horn. Michael, I am the shortstop flipping the ball to second base (laughs) for you to tag before you flip it over to Michelle at first. How has your week been? Uh, It's been another very interesting week, uh, continuing full force with the teletherapy, which has certainly had its pros and cons so far. Uh, Luckily enough, uh, the vast majority of my caseload is middle school school, high school, college age, young adult with my executive functioning ADHD. Uh, however, I work with several people and several, several, several people at Grow Now work with younger students. So they've been having a little bit more of a difficult time, uh, but really just learning as we go along. There's been a lot of really great re- uh, webinars and resources posted on the, um, the SLP Facebook groups. 
Uh, there's been really great uh, things that they've been able to do to learn different different ways to use Zoom and sharing your screen and uh, the boom cards that everyone's heard about th uh, this week that are really, really cool. Uh, what are, what are it, those? Tell me about those. So, so basically, it's like uh, online flashcards that you can use. Uh, if, if you go to like Google, type in boom cards, they're on like Teachers Pay Teachers. They're really, really cool. It's a really great interactive uh, game you can play through teletherapy with some of the younger kids. They love it. It's really cool. It's been a, it's been a hot topic this week with the teletherapy. So I highly recommend everyone who, who does uh, early intervention or elementary or kindergarten, look into the boom cards, look into different ways to keep your child engaged, do some, do some resources into parent education, because this, this teletherapy thing is going to continue for a couple of weeks now. And, uh, and I, I've always been under the belief that all children can benefit from teletherapy. There's, there's no such thing as, uh, as my child's not a good fit. And I think we'll talk about that today on the podcast and everything with all the teletherapy. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, it's been a, it's been a good week. Yeah, I have not looked at these boom cards yet, and that is on my uh, my radar to do so. Are you and the family doing safe or being safe out there, Mike? Yeah, uh, my parents are out in Long Island. Uh, they're much older, and they they take some medicine that decreases their immune system for rheumatoid arthritis. So they need to stay in the house. They can't be around anybody. Uh, so they're pretty much locked in there. My brother has been grocery shopping for them, which has been very helpful. Uh, but overall, yeah, family seems to be is, is doing well, all things considered. Definitely not taking any, anything for granted at this time. Uh, right. But yeah, uh, we're just kind of just getting by day by day like everybody else. I saw a Twitter comment, or not a Twitter comment, a Twitter story uh, where one of the news store, one of the news stations, I forget this was out west, uh, had posted a picture of a doctor who is staying outside of his home. And doing the little handprint with his like toddler, yes, uh, from the front porch. Yep. And then they posted a follow up. Uh, his family home was destroyed by a tornado over the weekend. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. The family's okay, but Jesus, when it rains, it pours. Michelle, how are you guys doing? What's been going on this past week? And then how are you and baby speech? Well, toddler speech science and military speech science all doing down there. <laughs> military speech science. I don't know. Is Have we ever said his name on air? I didn't my, want to oh, like my husband. Say it. Yeah, I think yeah. it's Ryan. Okay. You're good. Okay. How's Ryan doing? <laughs> well, I didn't want to be like, how's Ryan doing? You'd be like, we never said his name. It's all good. Uh, we, <laughs> we are healthy and well. My uh, husband, Ryan, is now... Um, teleworking i just like everywhere it has changed from 6 p.m one day to 8 a.m the next day of, of what's happening with people's works and uh where, where they are if they're going in if they're not and so we're adjusting in the last couple of days to having him in the guest room with a um hodgepodge setup of an office <laughs> and uh, <laughs> going from there just like a lot of people uh so that's a change i am still not working at my outpatient clinic because we are closed for another week but looking to try to prioritize the more acute cases which are mostly adult um, just for post-surge and post-stroke and post-tbi people who are really in need of of that therapy right away, especially physical therapy with some knee replacement surgeries, that kind of thing. So um, I know they're always trying to figure that out. The higher ups with the hospital network I work for, um, you know, limiting our limiting our, our travel in and out where we can, sure. doing doing what we can. So yeah, <laughs> there you go. And, and you guys are all pretty safe down there as well. Yeah, yeah, we're healthy and good and. Um, my extended family, like my siblings and my parents are in Ohio and they're doing well. We have firefighters, nurses, and government employees who are all st in our family who are all still, still working, um, having to take extra precautions there for their families. But that's like a lot of people across the country right now. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, for me, I, I recorded my videos last week for my students um, this week I am going to do the same thing. And then also I'm going to try to plan, uh, two live, uh, drop-in se sessions for all my students to kind of try out how this teletherapy is going to work with us. Um, uh, just hours ago, we we are recording this on March 29th. Uh, President Trump has extended the social distancing order until April 30th. So I have no idea what that means for any of us in the school system, because here in Ohio, we were scheduled to go back April 6th and it was just going to be kind of like two weeks to fill in the gap and then make up time uh, 
after these two weeks, so I have no idea what's going to happen with that. Um, I've upgraded my internet to 400 megabytes per second because I feel like we're going to need that. I've also added the Cinemax and Epix uh, movie channels because we're all stuck in here together and we need to watch something. And I've also been watching the Harley Quinn show on DC's app and Tiger King on Netflix. Everyone is talking about Tiger King. Have you guys seen Tiger King yet? I have yet? not yet. Yes, it was completely ridiculous. <laughs> is it worth well, is it worth my time to watch it? No. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> probably. Yeah, but it it well, it's just so unbelievable Michelle, ridiculous. Do you remember when the wild animals were released in Zanesville? Yeah, we were in grad school. Yeah. They touch briefly on that and then it's almost like a character study um about that about people that own exotic animals oh wow because that, that was that's a, a crazy nice way to put it right mike yeah. yeah i guess <laughs> i guess it was just it's just so it's just uh, so such an unbelievably strange uh, it's, it's the story just, i don't know i don't, Honestly, know, I don't know how to describe the, it the best tagline that i could put on this <laughs> is that it's if joe dirt <laughs> okay. Nice. Uh Good owned start. owned a tiger zoo. And he didn't like another tiger zoo owner who may or may not have fed her husband to tigers. But they also didn't like or were friends with the third tiger owner, zoo owner who has five wives. And so it's sister wives plus an exotic tiger zoo. <laughs> and however, the guy who was the model for Tony Montoya is the most normal of them all. And he just sold drugs to feed his tiger addiction. Yeah, that's a good way. That's the first three episodes. I think if the, if the, doc, <laughs> if the doc does anything, it kind of gives people something to talk about during this crazy time. It certainly right. found a strange way to bring people together. Uh, but for someone who loves a good informational documentary, it was uh, a little over the top, a little like whatever. Just think of the most ridiculous things you can in life and put it in one documentary. Yep. And that's but I will say this. <laughs> having I went to I went to school out near Zanesville, Ohio. I went to Muskingum University, which was Muskingum College uh, in New Concord, Ohio, home of John and Annie Glenn. Um, woo, woo. And the thing that they talk about in the first episode is the man in Zanesville who, before he committed suicide, um, he released his, what was it, 18 tigers, two black bears, two grizzly bears, a baboon, yeah. lions, all the way through the Zanesville area. And the Zanesville police had to, like, shoot him. I remember friends posting videos and pictures of 70 being shut down and, and all of that. So it was kind of interesting from a, oh, my gosh, that was in our backyard section. Mm-hmm. That was crazy, and that was where they had recorded 911 calls of people. It, yep. it sounded like something out of Jumanji, like, there is a tiger. And not a good way. Yeah, like, there, there is a tiger outside <laughs> right now kind of thing. So, <sighs> wasn't that? Well, let's get back to less crazy. Let's start off with our SS Pod due process and SS Pod shout outs. The SS Pod due process is your moment to complain or put on blast, whatever you want it to be. Last week, we said it was COVID-19. Do we have something new for the SS Pod due process did this week? Did we say that last week? We I did. Was Michael said it was. this week. <laughs> <laughs> Michael stole it for last week. No, you I had, <laughs> it wasn't COVID. You would. Um... It was the coronavirus. It was still COVID-19. Oh, okay. <laughs> I say this week, you know what? this week it's Trump. I'm saying. I, actually, I was going to say <laughs> it's the people, you know, it's a uh, near and dear to some of us here. Um, it's the people that don't use the right name and try to put any racial slant they can on the coronavirus and the COVID virus uh, by using the China virus or other oh. more. Yeah, like, or even more racial terms about it. You can social media that one up, but we'll put that under no, our due process. No, you don't need to search week. for that. That's just, yeah. no. Yeah, yeah. But on a positive, the SS, SS Pod shout out, it is where we want to recognize someone doing something really good. Uh, last week, we talked about Autumn Bryan and Expand Your Scope. Uh, we've had Rachel Arshambaugh, the PTSD SLP, try to say that six times fast, 
uh, as our SS Pod shout out. Do you guys have any nominations for a shout out this week? Because if not, I've got a great one, I think. I want to hear yours. Carol Baskin. <laughs> <laughs> No, she fed her husband to the tigers. Oh, okay, yeah, I forgot about no, that. our that's, S- that's for due that's for due process. <laughs> our I, I want to give the SS Pod shout out to frontline workers, especially the SLPs uh, that are still going out there. I still think that some of our job is essential, and those that are going out there to do dysphagia therapy, uh, those that are still working in the NICU, all suited up. Y'all get our SS pod shout out this week. Heck yeah. You know, putting you guys are helping p- feed people their first feeds after mm-hmm. innovation, after being on, <laughs> on ventilators, on, you know, all these things that are critical at this time and not just for COVID-19 patients, but right, right. everything else that goes on, even when there's a pandemic. So if you've got an SS pod shout out or an SS pod due process, head over to our website, speech science podcast.com. And you can email us speech science podcast at gmail.com or give us a phone call 614-681-1798. You know what? I think I'm going to update the website this next week since I guess we're in social isolation and maybe I'll put a uh, running list of our shout outs and due processes. That's a great idea. I like it. Yeah, I'll just add that to the list of things I don't have time to do. Oh, I also interviewed somebody this past week about telepractice. We got the Expressible crew on there finally. Nice. Yeah. And I do have bad news before we even get into the news today. Did you guys see the latest person, uh, March 29th, who have passed away from COVID-19? Yes. Could be anybody. Joe Diffie. Joe Diffie. Yeah. If you are a country person, Joe Diffie was... I love Joe Diffie, and that makes me really you'd, sad. You'd probably, even if you're not a big country fan, you'd probably recognize some of his songs. His John Deere Green, mm-hmm. uh, Pickup Man, a couple others. Mm-hmm. So, all right, well, let's get into something less depressing. Let's talk about COVID. <laughs> the most depressing Jesus. topic in the world. Uh, so let's talk about, we're, we've already talked about essential workers on the front line. Uh, I posted this article on Facebook a few days ago. Uh, Did you guys get a chance to look at the randomized trial of cloth masks compared with medical masks and healthcare workers? Um, I I, saw you posted it. I did not get to read it. I read everything you post, Matt. Oh, thanks. Uh, So the takeaway from that is cloth masks don't work as well as medical masks. (laughs) So we knew that. Well, so what they were doing is they were looking at... um, Participants use a mask on every shift for four consecutive weeks. Medical mask, cloth mask, or a control group, uh, which included the mask wearing, and the uh, laboratory-confirmed virus were significantly higher in the cloth mask groups compared with the medical mask groups. Penetration of the cloth mask particles was almost 97%, while the medical masks were 44%. Hmm. So, Which terrifies me, by the way. As it should. Yeah, so I mean, based on that, I I've talked to friends who are saying they're using they're using mm-hmm. it to like a cloth mask over top of a disposable one in order to extend the life of the disposable one, which is not ideal either. Right. But how about you, Matt? Because you're going into nursing homes still. So we are already on reuse uh, the mask protocol, the brown bag protocol, which is where you take your mask off. And you set it in a brown bag with the outside of your mask to the bottom of your bag. And then you seal your ba- you seal the bag up in your trunk. And then when you get it out, put it back on and then take it back off and use it until you can't breathe. That's okay. That's what we're doing right now. Yeah, I know. So actually, um, so my mom made me a cloth mask idea and then my mother-in-law stitched it up a little bit better but it's the same idea it's the cloth on the outside and then it's got like a pocket where i can put my disposable mask on the inside and then like felt slash flannel material on the inside to kind of create a triple barrier slash also keep my medical mask from getting too moist Hmm. okay i have no idea if that's going to be a better or worst case scenario but Honestly, from what I've read, the mask that I'm wearing anyway probably doesn't help too much. Yeah. I'm not wearing it. We don't have N95s. We have the uh, paper medical masks. I have seen 
uh, pictures of doctors and nurses wearing diapers mm -hmm. over their head because there's no masks. Yeah. It's just so, I mean, it, I'm not complaining, but it's just so crazy that we, you know, and anyone who had been watching the news over the past couple of months knew this was coming. And it's just so unbelievable how unprepared we've been. And our response has just been so disorganized, you know, in terms of not only just masks, but ventilators and uh, support. And, you know, the, the shutdowns have been very, uh, very disorganized. The, the overall response has added to the stress of these essential workers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you can't even find N95 masks anywhere at all right now. Mm -hmm. And it's only going to be worse. The takeaway, it says, uh, which the, the first clinical efficacy data of cloth masks suggests healthcare workers should not use cloth masks as protection against respiratory infection. Cloth masks result in significantly higher rates of infection than medical masks and also performed worse than the control arm. The controls were home care or healthcare workers who observe standard practice, which involved mask use in the majority, albeit with lower compliance and in the intervention arms. And the home care or the healthcare workers also use medical masks more often than cloth masks. Mm -hmm. nice. And they were saying part of it is because the 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 issue the germs, the virus lives on the outside of the cloth masks. But also, they said the N95 respirators provide super effic efficacy to the medical masks. So, okay. Well, that's depressing. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. I mean, I don't know. Let, let that moves on to the next one, Michelle. You kind of brought this one up in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Uh, they figured out a way to sanitize uh, those N95. I think it was Battelle. Is that right? Yeah, Battelle. So this, I was following this over the weekend because um, I my family's from Columbus, and uh, so I was catching up on some of the news near them with coronavirus-related things. And your governor, Matt, Governor DeWine, mm -hmm. um, issued a and his lieutenant governor issued a very strong statement towards the FDA who had only given Battelle a Columbus based company um, who has developed a technology for sterilizing masks, which means at least based on what I read um, means they could sterilize masks and have them back out to be reused the same day. And I'm talking hundred over a hundred thousand is their ability to, to sterilize. I think they said, let's see. 160,000 160, a day masks per day just in Ohio alone but the FDA had only approved them to sterilize 10,000 surgical masks for Ohio each day despite the ability to sterilize much more than that and so pretty strong statement came out from the governor saying this is not okay and why would you limit this technology that's a life-saving technology for our healthcare workers right and so by the time we're recording tonight on Sunday evening, March 29th, the update is that um, not only the head of the FDA, but then also President Trump has come out to make a statement um, in response to Governor DeWine's request that the FDA change this and that they're, they're not there yet, but they're, um, they're going to get it approved because uh, Battelle also was planning to has plans to send the groundbreaking technology to other places so washington new york washington dc virginia maryland areas um, sterilized masks can be reused up to 20 times so which is crazy amount of good times yeah but i mean that's if if you're changing it with every patient that's 20 more patients that you can see mm -hmm. i saw something where they said like a typical patient in the icu with this is using what was it? They said 18 masks, 18 sets of gloves, and uh, 24 uh, gowns, hmm. basically. Yeah. And so this is for single-use N95 respirators so that they can be reused by healthcare personnel. Side note, did either one of you guys know what an N95 respirator was before uh, this past week? Nope. I did because of home health. I had to be fitted for one. Oh, okay. really? Yeah. I mean, I never used it, but... No. We had to be Mike, fit for it just in case. I'm with you. I did not. And actually, I didn't even realize what one was until about three, four days ago. I have learned the most from uh, Governor Governor Cuomo's presentations. Uh, yeah. He describes everything very slowly in detail, and he has very uh, 
a fairly funny PowerPoint presentation that goes along with uh, with what he's doing. Uh, but but yeah, he's really described everything quite well. Um, and I've, oh, I've learned, yeah, so I've learned a lot about ventilators and alternatives and you know kind of the trajectory of what's going on from him. Yeah, I honestly didn't even think about it. And then all of a sudden someone, like, I saw a picture of one. I was like, oh, my God, those are just like the masks that I wore when I was sanding, like, a table over the summer. And I never realized that those were the N95 medical masks. Hmm. Yeah. Or I shouldn't say the medical masks, the N95 respirators. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Ugh. Our next story, and then we'll we'll take this. It'll take us up to break. Uh, the article I sent you guys. There were two of them. One was from the what was it? It was from the Chicago Daily Herald, uh, talking about special needs students falling through the cracks while schools navigate e-learning. And the second one was from WBHM. Uh, with schools closed, kids with disabilities are more vulnerable uh, than ever. And I thought we'd talk a little bit about those today. Uh, Mike, you were saying that you don't believe that there's any student that does not quite match up well for for home therapy? Yes. Um, I've, I've, I've seen that a lot. I would like to pick your brain on that yep, one. Yep, yep. Uh, I think that's uh, a, a speech and language therapist's first response to teletherapy when it is first thrust upon them. Uh, they, yeah. in, they instantly think of, you know, three, four students or maybe their entire caseload, who knows, of students that are just simply not a good fit for teletherapy. Uh, they think of whether the child is hyperactive, low attention span, or they're working on, uh, they have very little joint attention, whatever it may be. Uh, I've always been un under the belief that it's our responsibility as SLPs to use our creativity, use our relationships, use our parent counseling, parent training skills to figure out how to make this work. So whether it's, uh, whether the sessions have to look very, very different or whether it's mostly you telling the parent how to interact and telling them what to do and giving them tips on how to be sort of the quasi therapist within the sessions, whatever it is. Um, I truly believe that any child, whether they, whether they are in that early intervention, zero to three, three to five, very low functioning, whatever it may be, they can benefit from teletherapy. It's really just a matter of your treatment planning, how you approach it, how you involve the caregivers, how you involve the parents, what materials are you using? Are you finding uh, savvy ways to share the screen and make it motivating, make it engaging? Um, there's, there, there are ways to make this highly beneficial to families and make this a legitimate essential service uh, mm -hmm. that, that these kids can benefit from. And, uh, and th that's, you know, I, I don't really ever want to tell anyone how to do their job or whatever, but I, I understand this, t this teletherapy thing was thrust upon us very, very quickly. And, that, and that's the worst part about it. Is a lot of people went from, you know, the typical comfort zone of face-to-face -face therapy so all of a sudden, mm -hmm. this breakout ha happens, and now we're th teletherapy is being thrust on us by districts or whoever it may be. And the fact that it's happening so quickly sucks. I admit it, it sucks. But to say that it's just not going to work for your kids, um, I think that's, that's, a, that's something that we can certainly work around and use our skills to make it work. Well, I think you touched on the most important part of that, Mike, is that the right supports need to be in mm -hmm. place. That you know, having, depending on the age of the kid, um, that line of sight supervision or someone sitting right with the kid, helping facilitate what you're directing as the speech pathologist. Um, I think there's things that need to be in place to make it work. And it can be made work for a, made to work for a wide variety of patients. Now, question for you, Mike, because you're doing it right now and Matt's getting ready to do it. Is that correct? Yep. Um, has this past week changed your mind on that? Because I don't think knowing you a year ago that you necessarily would have been like, yeah, teletherapy, we can do it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say just having that experience. And this is something I'm always preaching in terms of ADHD and executive functioning is, you know, I'm always working with parents. These, these ADHD EF kids put themselves into a very small little comfort zone of preferred tasks whether it's their phone, YouTube, Minecraft, Roblox, Fortnite, whatever it may be, they find one thing they like and they stick with it and everything else is a non-preferred task and they have very few varied experiences each day that in turn helps them to build these skills. And that's really what this is for SLPs. 
is we are so used to face-to-face therapy in the classroom, in the clinic, in your office, whatever it may be. We're so used to this that this was thrust upon us so quickly, we just know nothing about it and we instantly shut down to it. It's non-preferred, it's not ideal, but now that I've done it for two weeks and I see the benefits and I see how kids can be so engaged and I hear from the parents afterwards that it's improving quality of life and it's improving their stress and their anxiety and their performance throughout the week, I'm, I'm, I'm sold on it. I, I'll always love face-to-face sessions. I, I cannot wait to go back to it, but teletherapy has its merits. It certainly does. Mm-hmm. Mike, I think you said something. I don't know if you meant to say it, but I think the most important part of what you said was, and, and I will disagree that I think every kid is can be a success in the traditional version of therapy if we try to move it to teletherapy. But I think the point that, that I, I love that you said was, we have to change what we are doing when we move to telepractice. So if we are thinking that we are going to work with our iGay student one-on-one doing telepractice, or we're going to work with our student who needs hand-over-hand maximum verbal redirections and guided questions through telepractice, those therapy sessions are not going to succeed. But Mike, you are 100% right. We got to change the way that we look at it because if we move for some of those students or some of those patients into a model, a peer model or a uh, education mode for the parent or training for the parent or training for the caregiver, that's how some of those those sessions succeed. I I 100% agree with you on that because I'm kind of with you where, you know, I think of some of my my students and some of my adults where I go, there's no way that I could do this. But if I look at it as, oh, I'm going to train parents to do what I'm do, not necessarily do what I'm doing, but training parents a little bit more than I normally do or training caregivers a little bit more than I do, you're 100% right. Yeah, we can we can look at therapy as this as teletherapy as this new and different and scary thing or Mm -hmm. or we can look at it uh in a totally different light you know this is you know we're so used to seeing our students at the school at the clinic you know the same thing week by week but this is really a really good chance for us to work with the kids while they're in the home the parents are there Mm -hmm. you know there's so many kids i see where i don't i really don't get to interact with the parents as much as i would like i have to reach out to them but now the parent is there in the home and the kid is in their home, they're in their zone, their environment, their, you know, stress and anxiety is different when they're home. Obviously, this is a very stressful and anxious time, yes, but a lot of our kids who are more introverted, who do need more, uh, who do need that social, and the, the kids who typically need these services are the ones that like to be home and like to be in their bubble, and, they, and that's, you're able to work with them while they're in that bubble. And you can kind of work with them while they're home, while they're on their computer in their room with their toys and their objects, not the th- not the things that you have in your clinic. You know, this is a this is a totally different thing that we have to experience here, and we can really make the best of it because you know before you know it, this this eventually will end, and we'll be back to the school. We, we'll be back to the clinic. You know, we're, we're all praying for that. But this is a chance for us to do something different and, and see what we can uh, make of it. The only negative I see from telepractice side for school-based SLPs is counting of the direct minutes. Because if you move into that, I'm educating the parent type role, I'm not sure how some states will count those minutes or not count those minutes. Um, and then also in some states that if you don't have a facilitator on site, like that line of sight, like you were saying, Michelle, Mm -hmm. that if the parent walks out of the room or, you know, even if it's a 17 year old student doing reading comprehension and vocabulary, you know, one of your EF students, Mike, if the parent walks out of the room, technically those don't count as therapy minutes in some States. And that's going to be some of those sticky wickets, you know, here in about two months when we have to talk about, does a student need compensatory minutes? Do they mm-hmm. need ESY? Mm-hmm. Uh, all this kind of fun stuff. Yeah, and and just how uh, HIPAA has kind of loosened their regulations during this time with Zoom and teletherapy, I think it's fantastic they're doing that. I think supervisors and administrators need to kind of loosen their standards a little bit. And and, and if we happen to be parent coaching, that's great. That's improving our students. That's mm-hmm. doing great work. 
and, and, and one other group that I've, I've kind of been in contact with over the past week is uh, female speech therapists or, or male, of course, with kids in the kids in the house. Yes, so if you're, I was if you're, mention it, it, that too. Yes. Yeah. that's one people that I don't have kids. I don't know what that's like when I'm doing my teletherapy. I don't have my own children running around. If you, if you have that, if you're a, a father, you're a mother, you have that happening during your sessions. I can't speak to that, but that's a whole nother battle that uh, I know a lot of people are dealing with. I do. Think, I was watching. Oh, sorry, Michelle. No, just, I think that's what's coming up with people I've been talking to who are trying to provide, whether it's teachers trying to provide mm-hmm. classes over, over the computer um, or individual lessons over the computer. And then they also have, depending on how many kids they have, one to however many kids who are either home from school or young and still need direct care and there's no daycare available. And they're supposed to be providing this, you know, (laughs) ethical appropriate therapy or educational instruction over the computer, but they have kids that they're supposed to be also in some ways homeschooling because they're trying to help them through the school that they're missing at that time and it's just I mean there's a lot I'm not dealing with that right now because my clinic currently is is not open so I don't know what's that's going to look like in a week or two but I we also don't have daycare right now so on that note Michelle I was laughing because I was watching Michael my oldest not Michael McLeod Michael my son uh he was doing (laughs) his preschool stuff and uh, like in the middle of nowhere, the teacher's son just runs through the background of the video, screaming his head off. And I was like, oh, I'm "Glad you teach kindergarten kids there, man!" Like, yeah, that. And I, I do have my sisters in law um, are in college right now, and they've talked about seeing their professors' pets <laughs> <laughs> quite often on the uh, the lessons. I think what sucks about this, so then we will wrap it up here, is that like. And Michelle, you and I were just kind of talking about it during the break, is that we don't know what's coming around the bend. We don't know if the states are going to just ignore the rest of the year and say the school year is over. And Mm -hmm. we are not worrying about makeup time. We're not doing any of that. We don't know any of that. Like Michael said, you know, maybe the state will allow leniency on minutes. I, I, we just don't know. Sometimes all it takes is one parent to sue for for everything to kind of go wonky. And I think that's the part that I find that sucks the most is that we just don't know how any of this ends. And for our kids that are receiving therapy, you know, for everyone that was working with a student or an adult trying to get them a communication device, all of a sudden now all that therapy time is over. You get 60 days to do your report and testing. And if you don't have it done, you got to start over. And I think that's the part that sucks the most, at least in my opinion. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. I mean, you're you're in a school, Matt, so you're seeing a different perspective than Mike and I are too. So it's, and I think for me, what I'm seeing is that, you know, in in the neighborhood I live in, I've already talked to multiple neighborhood friends who have kids out of therapy. And I work in outpatient therapy, but, you know, giving them just tips and tricks to try to do carryover activities at home because they either, whether it's because of HIPAA or like for mine, how do I communicate with my patients? I work at the hospital network, you know, yeah. it's not a private practice where I'm using my own phone to contact them. So how can I even provide carryover mm-hmm. materials for them versus in a school? Um, you know, if you're given the supports or not, or thrown into it, like most people, but there's still just this gap. And the trouble is, and Matt hit the nail on the head by saying, we don't know what's coming next. And we didn't know, most people didn't know a week ago that they were going to have to do teletherapy. So that's a big change. And we can't predict what's going to happen a week from now. And that's the hardest part, but we can get through it. We just have to hashtag be a willow. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's right. We want to hear from you, the Willows out there. Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. And from there, you can email us, speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com, or give us a phone call, 614 681 1798, or find us on the Patreon, patreon.com slash speech science podcast. And also hit us up on the Discord. I'm on Discord for a whole bunch of stuff, and I would love to talk speech science and speech therapy on the discord coming up after the break uh i yell at maranovich 
from Learn With Less talks about how to do therapy, how to be a parent with nothing more than cardboard rolls and cardboard boxes. Actually, it was super interesting, and I love the stuff that she talks about over there. And then also the informed SLP talking about hearing devices for toddlers. Uh, and then when we come back, we're going to talk about what we are doing as success stories in telepractice, uh, something good that Asha is doing, and then we will send this puppy home. You are listening to Speech Science. Hi, I'm Mei-Ling Chan. And I'm Martin Sibley. And we are the hosts of the Exceptional Leaders Podcast, where we spotlight high-profile topics and amazing people who are changing the worldview on disability. Even though we are oceans apart, we are bringing people from all over the world together to discuss inclusion, advocacy, accessibility, and real-life journeys. So listen to the Exceptional Leaders Podcast to hear the voices and stories from amazing changemakers and be inspired to make a real difference in the world. This is the story of a very special woman. Just a few knew about her superpowers. In a matter of seconds, she turned herself into a great mathematician. She masqueraded as a regular person at work, but as a superhero at home. Everyone knows her as Gabriella. I still call her Mom. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need to help, complete with tips and resources at aarp.org caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Speech Science. I'm Matt Hot. Excited to be joined by Ayelet Marinovich. Did I say it right? Amazing. I'm getting the two thumbs up. Uh, from Learn With Less Strength in Words. She has a podcast. She has a Facebook page, which I love following. <laughs> Ayelet, welcome to Speech Science. Thank you so much for having me. It is a pleasure. So I want to talk with you about everything you do, but first let's find out who you are. You and I met down at Ash in Orlando this past year. But finally, yeah. <laughs> and so one, you have your own podcast, the Learn With Less podcast. What made you get into that? And then what is Learn With Less? Yeah. So, yeah. Hmm. all right. So basically I have been a, really a pediatric speech language pathologist for the last decade, um, and I started out my career in AAC, doing a lot of work with emergent and early communicators, as well as users of all different kinds of devices, and, and then my career led me b more into early intervention, which I also have loved so much, and then I had children. Haha, <laughs> which, as you know, Matt, <laughs> always puts oh. an interesting spin on things, especially, you know, when you're like, oh, I, I totally know something about, you know, parenting and having children and being a parent because <laughs> I work with parents and children all the time. And then you're like, holy moly, <laughs> like th it is really hard <laughs> and it is. it is overwhelming and it is all of those things. And it doesn't matter in some ways how much you know or don't know about quote unquote parenting or ch early childhood um, because it is, you're so vulnerable and you, you do just need that reassurance from uh, some reasonable source. And it's very hard to find that <laughs> because there's so many people with so many opinions on all the things. And um, so basically, yeah, I got pregnant. We moved, my husband and I moved across the pond to London, the UK. And uh, I had this luxury of being very pregnant and having a lot of time on my hands because I was waiting for my license to transfer over to the UK, which I promptly got at 38.5 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> of course, right. Ready to open up a private practice with a week and a half left oh before, before something 30. shows up. It was ridiculous. And, um, and yeah. And, and so I had all this like time on my hands to think about what I wanted to do and learn about, uh, you know, this whole different system and approach to, uh, birth and child rearing and all of those things, which you get to learn about when you live in a new place that is completely different from your own culture and norms and systems. So what I did was I had this sort of idea in my head of, gosh, wouldn't it be great if 
because uh, I know, you know, I've heard that like early parenthood can be very isolating and mm-hmm. I am far from home and I don't have a support network near me. And wouldn't it be nice if I maybe used my skills and knowledge that I know I do have about play and very early communication and how babies and toddlers learn and applied that to you know, my own experience. (laughs) Um, and that's what I did. So essentially once, once I had my baby, I started inviting fellow new parents, uh, that I had met along the way during my pregnancy. And in those first few months, uh, into my home for basically they were like somewhere between a, like parent family enrichment, parent support, parent education, developmental music class, tea and chat as one does in London. (laughs) And like, you know, all of the things that like I really needed. (laughs) And I, and I also had all of these skills that I could actually use, like all of the things that I was like, Oh my God, what, what on earth am I doing here? But Oh wait, I do know some (laughs) things. And I could see that many of my fellow new parents were struggling with the question of, you know, okay, well, what am I supposed to do with this thing all day? This like tiny human ish form that looks like a human blob is, <laughs> is not terribly interesting until it does that funny little thing or makes that silly little sound. I don't really know what I'm supposed to be saying. I don't really know what I'm supposed to be doing. Am I doing all the right things? Am I getting all the right stuff? And so now those were really the questions that I was helping Uh, people answer and really I was showing them how to do that with the things that they already have so what started as like a early development class and just group led into me wanting to then take this on the road as it were (laughs) Uh, because I I wanted we knew we weren't going to be in London forever and I was like well how can I take this knowledge and, and broaden it and so that's why I started the podcast So very long answer to your very short question. (laughs) No, it's good. And then you've also got two books. You've got Understanding Your Baby, a week-by-week development and activity guide. And then you also have Understanding Your Toddler, the one to three-year-old, a month-by-month development and activity guide. Did those two happen before the podcast, after the podcast, or about the same time? What, What was that? So the podcast started actually four years ago, almost to the day as we record this, Matt, which is hey, super exciting. I know. If you're a Redditor, it's your cake day. Happy cake day. It's my cake day. <laughs> so um, yeah, I started the podcast. I simultaneously had been, you know, as I was leading these groups, I was writing down all of the things that I was sharing, all the questions people had. And I was doing these sort of classes along the way as my first child was growing. So really from birth to two and then three years, um, I was leading these groups and answering questions and, and sharing information. And, uh, and so I have this collection of information. I started the podcast to answer some of those questions and to explore some of those topics in early development. And then the books kind of came out of uh, a need to, you know, and a desire to, to share that information in a, in a broader, on a broader scale, I guess you could say. Um, cool. So really they kind of came out simultaneously over time, mm-hmm. <laughs> but the podcast came before, started before the books did. Ah, okay. Okay. So your whole motto, I love it, is the learn with less. And we've talked through, I don't, you know, Facebook Messenger or whatever. And <laughs> and and full disclosure, I have told you per- off air that I feel like uh, sometimes as a terrible parent, as I like read what you say to do, like not what you say to do, but what you suggest to do as, you're re- as we record this, you can see in my background, I've got <laughs> a wall of toys just as a shrine. But so the whole idea, if I, if I could paraphrase it into one sentence, yeah, you don't need the cool, shiny toy, correct? Right. You don't, you don't need it. It's great. It's awesome. It's there. You can buy it, but um, you already have everything you need. And I think in this culture in which we live, which is all 
all about sort of the baby industry saying, you need this, buy this, your baby's brain is, you know, exploding, you need to fill it, and you need to be everything, and you need to do everything, and you need to buy everything. I, I saw from the very beginning in my own experience what that does to parents. And not, I mean, and of course, you can also apply it to a therapeutic context, obviously, right? This, and this applies universally, right? It doesn't matter what culture, what language you speak, what languages you speak, what socioeconomic bracket under which you fall. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't, none of these things, this is a universal truth. When you have a baby, <laughs> I think a lot of parents, their first question is, okay, well, what do I need to buy to make sure I'm doing enough, that I'm doing the right things? Mm -hmm. And the answer, of course, is that you already have everything you need. You are enough. And you're probably already doing it. Because as we know, <laughs> it's the everyday routines. It's the everyday rituals. It's play, talk sing and move. And those are the four pillars of what I call the learn with less curriculum, which are really, when you integrate more of those four things into the everyday, into every single moment that you have with your child, and I'm not talking about like, you know, these heavy handed, intense, like, you know, do this, say this, like there's a script to everything. And if you don't do it, then you're doing it wrong. Like, I'm just like, and introduce an element of playfulness to a diaper change. Done, right? I was going to say my kids love... baby a little bit more <laughs> from one room to another. Done. Sing a silly song. And it doesn't matter if you're musical, right? Make a rhythm about singing on one word while you're building a block tower, whatever it is, right? And move around. Like, that's it. You're done. You're golden. <laughs> I was going to say to this day, my oldest is six. My youngest is three and yeah. my oldest Same. still loves the poop song with which oh, yeah. I'm going too much into it. It was just my only way of sanity when changing a diaper was to sing this because <laughs> it was like the only, it, it was like you pooped, you pooped, you really, really pooped. I can't believe you pooped, <laughs> you pooped like, and it just, and I would just make it up. And it was the only way that I could keep their eyes on me. So then they were trying to grab towards me so I could do a quick diaper change. Exactly. And then we it's know like, how effective these tiny little tools are. But I, I love that. I love that idea of just play, talk, sing, and move because I don't know how many times I could, you know, I get, I work middle school and high school, yeah. so I don't really work too much with the little ones, but we have friends that have little ones and they're <laughs> like, Hey, what do I do? And and it's like, well, research says to do this. I love that idea of just breaking it down to, to play, talk, sing, and move. Do you ever feel? And and, and we all sell something. We all sell, you know, <laughs> our podcast or we sell our services. Right. But do you ever feel that you're trying to sell, not buying anything? And do you ever like? Do you feel that that you're missing out? Like, okay, yeah, in, in no, that realm, does so that make sense? <laughs> Totally. And it's so funny that you asked that question right now because uh -oh. <laughs> just yesterday I received an email from uh, a founder of a toy subscription box, mm -hmm. oh, good. <laughs> um, which I have gone after <laughs> in many a post. Right. I've um, seen yours. In yeah. various ways. Right. And I don't name, I'm not, I'm not here to be an a-hole. Right. Like mm -hmm. I just, I want to just, I want to diffuse this idea. I want to show that the emperor has no toys, people, right? Like, come on. <laughs> and when you look at the stuff in these toy subscription boxes, like, yes, they're wonderful, great things. Many of them, some of them, right? But like, come on, it's a wooden tissue box with handkerchiefs in it. The emperor literally has no freaking toys. Come <laughs> on. And you're paying 40 plus dollars a month for that? That's crazy to me. I just got an you email. You already have it. It's in your recycling bin. <laughs> I just got an email the other day from, uh, from I think it's KiwiCo yeah. or something. It's like the monthly subscription box for yeah. uh, science projects. And I was yeah. like, oh, maybe this is like, and then I started looking at the projects and I'm like, most of this is stuff I do already in therapy. It's great. Yeah. Why am it's I going to spend 20 bucks a month to do the same thing with my kids at home? Yeah. I'll just spend an extra buck and buy an extra set of materials. Like, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, so here's, here's the thing. My entire business model is predicated on the idea that if people understand that they're already doing it and all they need is the right information at the right time and very simple tweaking ways to figure it out, I can provide that to them. So I, I do sell information and I, and I also sell community because people want a trusted resource. That is, we all know that as, True. as interventionists, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and if people want a, a place and a way to get trusted information in a way that they feel supported, um, I can give that to them. And I can do that at various levels. I can do that with a free podcast. I can do that with a book that's, you know, $10, $15. I can do that with a membership that, you know, they pay a certain amount every, every month and they get access to the information exactly when they need it, as well as community, as well as support, as well as an opportunity to integrate that information in various ways. Um, so I do, I, do, I do benefit monetarily. Um, right. This is a business, right? I mean, right. I would love, I would love to be able to to share information for free and spend a whole lot of my time giving out free information. But the, the fact is, I do value my time, as I know everyone does. I was going to say, when uh, you find that that fountain of money, let me know. Children, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Like, it would be great if I didn't have to sell anything. But um, but I'm also fine because I've spent a lot of time and energy creating programs and and products and services that I know are valuable. I guess my question more was do you ever feel like you're you're leaving money out there because you're literally <laughs> telling people like no 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 like you, you don't look need at to the, buy the anything. Yeah. right you look at these <laughs> subscription boxes you look right. at you know in our field there are tons of people saying this is the best teacher pay teachers is a perfect example, right? Like this is the greatest social skills thing in the world. And you, pr and you buy it for a dollar and then it's something I could have created in Microsoft <laughs> word. Do you ever feel that, you know, you're like, Oh, I could monetize this like even more, but this goes against everything I believe in or every is that single day. Yes. No, I, I can't have certain people on my podcast. I can't, um, you know, <laughs> On my own honor, my own sense of honor <laughs> tells me, obviously, that I cannot, uh, you know, I can't have sponsors on my podcast, for instance, that like, here, this, this is the best toy in the universe. Like, well, <laughs> but, or you could just, you know, grab the empty toilet paper roll and do that same thing. Well, <laughs> and I'm glad you say that. And I was going to make the joke, and I guess we'll actually talk about it as a serious topic. Like, <laughs> please. The thing I can't stand as a parent, I, I have, a, like I said, I have two six, I have a six year old and a three year old boy, Michael and Andrew. I love them. The oldest one has gotten sucked into these Ryan play videos or whatever, where he opens up the newest toy. Have you seen these? Oh, is it like an unboxing video or something? Yeah, but the kid now has a Nickelodeon TV show all his own. Oh, jeez. And his own toy line, which are oh, wow. literally just repackaged other toys, but they're <laughs> Ryan's toys. Oh my I, God, how weird. Right. And it's <laughs> like, as a parent, I go, I don't think I could sell my child's face yeah, for, for fascinating. even though he made like $8 million last year on these YouTube videos. But like, it, so wow. you see it more than I do. And, and, and of course, this is your, your passion. But like, <laughs> what causes, no, 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 like what causes you know, the parent, you know, like you see over mine, these are all my collectible toys, but like, oh, yeah, but, that's, but what, I feel like that's different too, right? Uh, you're, you're an adult. These it's are the things a that hole. have value to you in a certain way. Like it's great. It's filling a hole and again, somewhere. Like, I'm also, I'm not anti-toy. I have oh, no, toys. No, 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 no. But, but <laughs> no, know? what I'm asking is though, is like what causes parents to say, oh my gosh, I need, you know, cause my kid's like, oh, I want everything. But like, what causes that parent moment where you're like oh my gosh i need to find the perfect luke skywalker toy but it can't be different than the <laughs> jurassic park figure which can't be different than the gi you know what i mean what where do I you think, think a lot of times it has to do with what uh, if i am understanding your your question correctly i i think a lot of times it has to do with number one a parent wanting to get the right thing right the right mm -hmm. thing that's going to support a developmental skill for their child or 
a parent also, or and or a parent also just like not quite knowing how to say no in certain situations, right? Like mm -hmm. it's tough get, getting in and out of Marshall's or, you know, I don't know, any sudden toy store right. without buying anything for your child, right? You go in there and you're looking for a birthday gift for somebody and it, that's tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it's, you know, and that again, I think has a lot to do with a parent's knowledge of early development and mm -hmm. of setting limits and managing behavior and understanding, um, you know, what, what is in fact important, um, and, and draw and knowing how to draw the line in certain areas. Um, so I think all of that has to do with it. Um, and I also think that like, if, if more parents and caregivers understood, you know, what, what, what it is that goes into supporting learning, they would look at things very differently, right? Because like one, one parent might go into over, you know, you have a play date, right? You, your toddler, mm -hmm. you have a 12 month old, your toddler made friends at the park with another toddler and like, oh, you want a parent play date. So you go over to the other pa family's house and you see what they have and you say, oh, look how fun and engaged they are with that toy that they press the buttons and it's doing all these spinny things and it's singing and wow that looks like it must be really useful mm -hmm. or it's the wooden toy that like does all these beautiful things and like it's lovely but you don't realize that like you know what the <laughs> literally the entire like the reason why that's interesting is the same reason why a crinkly plastic bottle full of water is interesting like it's it would be exactly the same thing to your child. Um, <laughs> but, but of course, like when you see that and it's like keeping your child engaged, like, oh, sure. Like I'm going to go out and buy that too, because that was useful in that one time when I got to actually like hang out with that other parent and my kid was really engaged or like it really <laughs> felt good or it looked great. And that person has it and I like that person. So I should get that too. Like, yeah, get it. But know why it's a good or like not a good quote unquote mm -hmm. good toy, but like know why it's valuable and understand what what it's doing and what what the rationale is behind it. And I get it. Not everybody wants to think of these things. That's fine. But my, you know, my presence on social media, my hmm, my message is very much about like, you know, <laughs> you have a and I've had this like recent sort of run of things that are, are going really well that people really seem to enjoy, which is like, you know, okay, it's a, uh, <laughs> it's either a, a toy kitchen or it's your own cabinets. You know, yes. they, hold, they both hold the same <laughs> developmental value. You don't need to buy the toy kitchen. You have a kitchen. <laughs> well, I love that your post about that. Like, what was it? The one that was just popped up on my feed today. Was it like, <laughs> like a blade of grass and a tree branch or something? And oh. I just loved it because it was like, and I'm, I'm scrolling. Oh, there it is. Okay. So no, it was yesterday. It was like a leaf and, and something else, but it was, I yeah. love that. I love that you like post questions that you can do with it. Um, just make people think for a second, because that's all we have time yeah. for anyway. Right? Like a second. You, you um, were saying what's possible in that snap second. Yeah. You were saying about setting limits and, and I'm trying to oh, teach yeah. my son about buying crazy. something you really want versus just buying something. Cause you feel like you need it. Oh, yeah. And you know, and, and we go into <laughs> antique toy stores because their dad's a child and that's what it is. <laughs> but like I, I told my son, I was like, bud, I have no problem. If you see something and it's something you really, really want. And you've, we've talked about it before. Right we can talk about it, but I'm not here to buy garbage that you're not going to like. Yeah. So like the store owner, you know, nice guy. I've known him for a while. He's like, you know, talking <laughs> and Michael go, my oldest goes, is this something I want or is these garbage? And I was like, ah, <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> yeah, they're garbage buddy, but like not in that way. Like, so I know the Sorry. research, right? <laughs> I know the research is out there that shows that like toys that make noise, toys that talk are 
they impact language development because the child doesn't have to play with the sounds, doesn't have to pretend to talk like the fire captain or talk like Iron Man. Ooh. But Ooh. is there you know, and and is there same research about specialized toys or is it is there not research in that area yet or do you understand well, what I'm I mean asking? I think so. So, well, first of all, like those, the toys that like where you press a button and then it says a sound and it's like, oh, like this is an educational toy because it teaches the child what a square is, right? Right, right. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh God, please turn it off. Right. I mean, we know that um, a child is going to learn new vocabulary through interaction with mm -hmm. a person uh, much more quickly and more efficiently than with a machine, a screen. And really what that toy is actually teaching more about is cause and effect, mm. right? You press the button, it's going to have a certain impact. That's, there you have it, done. Um, so it really depends on, you know, what, priority is the problem is when when the baby industry markets an quote-unquote educational toy there's also no standard set for that right i mean oh, really? anything can be an educational toy no oh, there's, you i didn't know that a certificate i didn't know that i just happily assumed there was no yeah i think a lot of people do <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's just a thing that you can say <laughs> anybody can say it i mean i can literally put that a, a stamp that says educational toy on a toilet paper roll and it would be just as effective see that is as, how you monetize the as, next level I know, right? yeah. <laughs> as a i mean the toilet paper roll or the microphone it's the same thing right? well, and that's where i'm asking about the research is there any research yeah. that shows like a, a kid that can you know manipulate the same object into five different what do we call that like imaginative play so right like open-ended toys thank you Yes, there is a ton of research about the fact that loose parts, open-ended toys, um, any kind of object or material wherein a child can play where there's no specific objective value and there's no specific goal in mind, that it can be a bunch of different things. It can have a lot of different properties. It can become many different things. That is what's valuable. And I think part of for me too, what I, what I tried to dispel is like that, that then you get into this, okay, well then I need the organically stained wooden blocks, the Montessori materials. I need a specific, mm -hmm. like I need a specific philosophy to put its stamp of approval on my, my purchasing decisions because then I'll know I have the right stuff. Right. When I'm like, well, no, <laughs> <laughs> you can also stack snack containers and Tupperware bins and cardboard boxes. Mm -hmm. And that gets the same job done in terms of fine motor skills and, you know, creating the means to an end when you're like sequencing an idea and a behavior and an object and putting it on top of another object, right? Like, what are we talking about here, guys? Right, right. <laughs> Obviously, it's wonderful to also have a lot of different kinds of sensorial experiences, right? We want to have, um, we want to have our children experience lots of different textures. So yes, wood is great, but there's wood outside. Plastic, sure. There's plastic in your kitchen. Makes sense. I don't know. I mean, I think it's oh. just it's so important to have that variability in all of our experiences, but we don't have to define them in those rote specific ways. And that's sort of the key, right? I was so happy when my oldest and and if you haven't heard the show before, like I use my sons as like the examples of <laughs> what examples. to do yeah. or what not to do <laughs> as like parenting or therapy. But like I, I tried so hard with my oldest because he was a very compartmentalized kid where mm. it was like the what are the big legos called not the they're not legos oh, yeah, they're duplo, the, uh, think, yeah, yeah. the duplos he was like the duplos are for building homes the dinosaurs oh. are over here this ghostbuster house that you know it was my <laughs> ghostbuster house from when the 80s happened you know this isn't yeah. this and then all of a sudden like i don't know when it happened it was like between three and four hmm. like 
the dinosaurs were living outside the Ghostbuster house, which was then the command center. The Duplos became the fencing. And I'm like, yeah. we did it. Imagine we merged our play. toys. Dramatic and then, play. Yeah. And then the Millennium Falcon <laughs> came in and like got bit by a T-Rex. And I'm like, yes, this is what you need to do. Great. Yeah. So before, uh, and, and you be generous with your time because you're out in air. Where are you? I'm in California. California, you're, I think okay. You're the one on the East Coast. So I I'm, am. It's all fun <laughs> time. You're late so, for me. It's, ah, it's all good. <laughs> I, I want to touch base with you just a little bit on video games. No, and sure. It's, or, you know, just screen time in general. Yeah. I work with the middle school kids. So yeah. I'm always telling parents, I'm like, please just get the device out of your kids' hands. Like, it's already too much, you know, yeah. and, and I fight that battle every day with my kids. It's, okay, you can play on the video games for 15 minutes and then you're done. Mm -hmm. What is the research that you're seeing? What is, you know, the difference between me playing in Minecraft versus, you know, Legos, or even I love this, the post you had about the cups and the bowls, like the yeah. stackable stuff. Like, yeah. why is the real stuff better? And I know that answer, but I just kind of want to hear from an expert because, yeah. you oh, know. <laughs> Well, you're an, you wrote Here a book that makes you an expert, expert at some right? point, right? <laughs> <laughs> you have a book. I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just preface that by saying that I always like when if any, and I'm I'm fine with being like a EI person, but mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not a parenting expert. I have that's two fair. kids. I try to be an expert on them, but they change every day. So right. that's the hope that I hope to. Uh, enjoy every day and hopefully someday we will all become experts on each other as we continue down this game. <laughs> I like that. Right? I like that answer, so, by the way. There's, there's the start, right? Okay. So now that's out of the way, let's talk about what, like we were talking about earlier, right? You have this idea of you're touching something. We experience the world with our senses, right? We are multi-sensorial beings. Um, we have all of these, you know, we know that our sensory system is very connected to how we experience the world. It affects so many things about how we are and integrate information into our bodies and how we are in the world. So when we take the experience of um, play and we put it directly into a screen and Yes, you've got some manipulations that you're doing with your fingers, but you're not touching the objects. You're not touching the blocks. You're not playing. You're not figuring out, you know, that perceptive, uh, proprioceptive mm -hmm. uh, understanding of how much force you need to move something, manipulate True. something. Um, you have no idea how it feels. You don't know what it smells like. You don't know anything about it except what you see and what you hear from a screen. It's creating your experience of the world. You don't get to be in charge of your experience in the world. And I think that's so much about what families really need to remember about play and about all of those four pillars of play, talk, sing, move, right? A screen makes the decisions for your child. Um, whatever we're talking about. I don't think that screens are the devil. I think that they don't respect. I don't, I don't think that they replace anything, mm -hmm. right? I think sometimes what we see is that families think that, oh, well, my child is attentive for a longer mm -hmm. time while they're watching a screen. So that's going to be building his attention when we know that that is absolutely not what research says. And right. we know that that is not the case. And what does build attention is open-ended play imagination, mm -hmm. creation, experimentation, observation, interaction, imitation, all of the things that we know that we as speech language pathologists want to enhance and integrate into our children's lives. So, um, so that said, a video game is going to create and provide a limited experience. That's, that's basically all I have to say. I that. went down. So <laughs> we, we we met in Orlando, but like yeah. the uh, we've had season passes this this year for Disney because we went more times than nice. any human should have gone to Disney. <laughs> I am Disneyed out for <laughs> a few little years. But when we went in June, 
we were in line and this mom and I'm not, I don't judge parents, but I just, I had that moment where I <laughs> sure judged do, another, Matt. I judge parents. All, <laughs> let's be honest. I judge everybody, but I at least say I don't. So I feel better. This mom opened, they were in line in Disney. She opened up her bag and no joke. There were at least three tablets and multiple charging cords wow. and handed both kids a tablet and then took their phones and started char and I was just like while they were standing in line to go <laughs> on a ride <laughs> and I was just amazing. like y'all realize um, that you paid a lot of off. right yeah. like and and yeah. mind you the ride we were getting on was that like Epcot ride about how like they grow vegetables like for yeah. Disney which <laughs> let's be honest not the most exciting ride for kids like I get that <laughs> but like you're literally in a ride queue wow. to learn something mm. and you're just mm. going to give your kids the screen like that Amazing. blew my mind. Yeah. Right. Think of like, yeah, I think <laughs> we think about, I, I hear from parents all the time. I feel so guilty because I don't have time, resources, energy, fill in the blank to, mm -hmm go and take my child to such and such class or such and such experience or, yeah. and I'm like, but don't you realize that going to the grocery store is the mm -hmm. experience? And then you see parents who are helping their children shut off and, and, yes. and put themselves into a screen so that they're not bored mm -hmm. while you're at the grocery store, while you're in line, while you're at the restaurant. And I, I mean, I get it. I have two young children. I know that sometimes you just have to survive and get through the day. But what <laughs> if we took a reframe and you realized how many opportunities for inclusive interaction and conversation and observation that you have mm -hmm. just by walking into a grocery store? Choice making narrative building, mm -hmm. wondering aloud, all of it. I mean, it's all right there. We, uh, we, my oldest, we have a rule that like, if I tell you to put away the device and you start to cry, that tells me that you've been on it way too much <laughs> too <long. laughs> and you're about to lose it for weeks. Like not just a day, but like a week detox. Yeah. And at first he was like, ah, and now he's just kind of like, okay, cool. Time to turn it off. But our, yeah. our family rule when we go out to dinner is that no devices until dessert <laughs> comes. <laughs> nice. And then that's when mom and dad, if mom and dad want to sit and just enjoy. <laughs> if we've like, made it that far, yeah. <laughs> you know, usually we're talking an hour into the meal and it's like, you know what, yeah. guys, you're getting yeah. antsy. Here, watch a yeah. cartoon. Let mom and dad yeah. just enjoy being with other adults for 10 minutes. <laughs> And it's hard, right? Because we all have a different level of like what mm -hmm. we can tolerate, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. I think the important thing for people to understand and realize is what what you're missing out on and what's important mm -hmm. and what's valuable. You have to be the one to decide that for your own family, but if you are making that decision without understanding some of the very basics, then that's rough, man. Like you're mm -hmm. missing out. You're literally missing it. And that's hard. I, I remember to this day, my oldest was maybe a year and a half old. And <clears throat> excuse me, we were walking out of the grocery store and I don't remember what we were doing. Like I was like, it was one of those smaller carts so I could spin the cart without like flipping him out. You know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah. and like, we're just goofing. And this lady walks up and I was like, like instant uh -oh. dad shield went up. I was like, <laughs> and she was just like, it's so nice to watch somebody talk to their kid and then just walked away. And I was like, wow, was I, what was I doing? That was that weird, but you're right. You're now your that I'm just watching it, you're with your child and you're talking to the, yeah, it's hard. And, and he's on, on a device. So yeah. I want to ask you before we wrap up and, and I hope you come back cause this was awesome. And I feel Good. like we could talk for another five hours, which so fun. I, I don't want to tonight, but I do want to in the future. <laughs> um, 
if you could boil everything down, your motto, your the idea of your show yeah. into like a 30 or 60 second sound bite, what would you want people to know or or, or do or or believe, you know, like what do you want people to leave with, I guess I should say? Yeah. I mean, really it's all about it it's the fact is first of all if you're a parent you know you you rest assured you already have everything that you need and if you are an interventionist and you are working with ei parents you're working with in families with infants and toddlers of any developmental level there are very simple ways to help your families whether you're taking a routines based intervention approach whether you are simply working with families um, to help them understand what what is making the difference and what you can infuse, you know, more communication into their everyday routines and everyday, you know, items. This is it. Like you already have everything you need. It's there, and um, you can raise a great human from day one without having to buy a single toy. Literally. <laughs> I like Literally. that. I like that. All right. So anyone that's listening goes, oh my gosh, I got to get more of this. Where do they find you? Where do they go? Yeah. Come on over to learnwithless.com. Everything is there. You'll find the podcast. Um, the podcast is also, of course, on, you know, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, all the, all the general places. Um, and if you want to hit me up on social media, I'm at Learn With Less, both on Instagram and Facebook. And I'd awesome. love to chat with y'all. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Matt. So fun. Hi, I'm Stephanie Munoz from the Informed SLP. Keeping anything on a toddler that the toddler doesn't want to wear is one of life's great challenges. Hats, sunglasses, pants, the struggle is real. When you add hearing aids into that mix, watch out because there may be things flying at your head. So if you work with toddlers who are deaf or hard of hearing, you are 100% going to get parents coming in saying that they have the hearing aids, but their toddler just won't wear them. Ambrose and colleagues noticed the same problem. So they developed a parent education program called Ears On to get families using their child's hearing aid or cochlear implants. Importantly, they found that Ears On worked better than standard early intervention, meaning we as SLPs and the teams we work on may not always be hitting the nail on the head when it comes to providing adequate support to young children with hearing impairment. Of course, to fully implement this as the research team did, you'll want to go grab the original study published in the Journal of Deaf Studies and Deaf Education. But for now, Let's talk about two aspects of Ears On that might be different from your usual care. First, an educational workshop for parents. Parents know that hearing aids help their child hear better, but they usually don't know that not wearing them means that their child can't hear speech, or that a child who can't hear speech is at risk of a speech language delay that they won't just catch up from. Parents need both the verbal explanation and visuals like the good old speech banana, in order to really understand the importance of hearing aids. What might seem like the obvious impact of hearing loss on speech language and later academics might not be obvious at all to parents who are just learning about this for the first time. We have to emphasize to parents that the hearing device is the primary way of preventing language delay if the child isn't getting language through a fluent signing community. It's not easy to keep hearing devices on a kid who doesn't want to wear them, but education and empowering parents to feel confident based on their previous successes is crucial. The second thing that really stood out from this paper was that early intervention from SLPs can't just be about speech and language goals. Device use needs to come first. Remember, all the language stimulation in the world won't help if the child can't hear it. So let's optimize the child's hearing or exposure to language first and then move on to other therapies. To learn more about this paper and other new research, check out our reviews on the informedslp.com. There's links to both the original article and the review in the show notes. 
The Informed SLP makes it easy for you to stay up to date on all of the clinically relevant research across the lifespan that comes out every month. Know what works to do what works. Welcome back to Speak Science, episode number 108. I'm Matt Hot, surrounded by my friends, Michael McLeod. What's up, buddy? And Michelle Wintering. Hi, Matt. We're all being willows. We are all being willows. And Mike, I consider you one of my best, not best, close friends that I have never hung out with. In person. You can say best. You can say best. Well, no, I mean, like, it feels weird to say you're like one of my best friends that I've never actually met in person. But it's hey, cool, we just cool. said how important relationships <laughs> are through a screen. So that's, that's right. That's we right. See, I see you more often than I see most of my like friends I went to school with. He was about to say real best friends. <laughs> that's right. Especially especially these past few weeks. Right. We just see each other almost on a weekly basis, buddy. And then Michelle, you and I went to grad school together, so of course, yeah, whatever. Anywho. Fine, thanks. <laughs> So, Mike, you actually, there goes my voice, by the way, cracking. Um, Mike, you had a great idea. Uh, You said, let's talk about telepractice success stories. And I thought, and if we didn't have anybody that we know that's a telepractice success story, I thought maybe this would be an opportunity to talk about some of the stuff that we are doing. We touched base on it just a little bit before the break. Um, One of the big things I want to start off with is the Nuzella. Um, We talked a little bit about it last week with Rachel, but... I love this New Zella classroom assignment. I can give a reading. I can set it to either dynamic or static on the reading level. So if a student gets questions wrong, it like lowers the test questions to help them get more questions right. I like that. And then lets me know what reading level they should be at. Very cool. I need to look into that. That's awesome. I don't know if it's free or not because I think my school district pays for a New Zella subscription, but I am loving it. Mike, what you said boom cards earlier. What else are you doing in telepractice right now? Because you work with more EF kids, the executive functioning kiddos. So let's pick your brain tele, telepathically, te, te, teletherapically. Mike, what are you doing in teletherapy? Well, uh, basically we talked about how this switch to teletherapy was a major change for us from, you know, preferred to Mm non-preferred. And really it's the exact same thing for, for our students. They love, you know, if, if we're doing therapy and we're focusing on, on relationships, rapport and engagement, you know, these kids loved coming to my clinic and, and doing different games there. And that was their routine. That's what they were comfortable with. And now to kind of interrupt their uh, quarantine game time or their quarantine, you know, sleeping late or whatever it may be time, uh, and then say, hey, you, you got to hop on the computer and talk to Mike for a while. You know, some, you know, we need the buy-in from them too. So one of the things I love to do is kind of give them that sense of control and give them that sense of you know, ownership for things. So the, one of the cool things about Zoom is you can teach the kids how to share their screen. So I've been having a lot of the students press the green button at the bottom to share their screen so that on my computer I see their computer uh, and we look at like Google Earth together. We, they show me like their favorite YouTube videos. Uh, they'll show me different websites they go on, different groups, different memes they think are funny. So I, you know, I take the first five, 10 minutes for them to kind of just control the session, use the share option. And then, you know, I really love to use uh, the whiteboard option on Zoom. Uh, the whiteboard is really helpful. You can put some really fun things on there. Uh, and, and then I pull things up on, on my screen and I share my screen with them. So there's, there's things in teletherapy that work so well in practice that you can't do face-to-face. So I've been trying to kind of uh, to really use all of Zoom's options, and Zoom has been a very good experience so far. And, and thank God for this podcast. Okay, I, <laughs> Are you I one would, of them even had I Zoom? I would have no idea what Zoom was. <laughs> and did you say, um, does Zoom have the dry erase board, like the whiteboard? Yes, it does. Option? Yeah, yeah. If you, press the, if you press the green share button at the bottom, and then Look you, at this. You're teaching us things. And then you select whiteboard. It's the coolest thing oh! ever. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, I I'm can also do my iPhone, iPad. Wait, hold on. Yep. A plug-in is required. Oh, I don't. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, Michael See? is sharing the whiteboard. Oh, yeah. the whiteboard. 
This is the whiteboard, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> As he misspells idiots, by the way. Sorry. Well, oh, I love that you just told so everyone cool. listening that this is a cool Check it out. option you can use. Yeah, yep. so on Zoom, again, Mike, you're right, it is down by the green share button. Mm-hmm. And what I do like about Zoom, by the way, and it's not just because we use it, and Zoom, if you're listening and you want to give us a free subscription, I'm not going to be against that. Um <laughs> We're a podcast. We can sell things. But the the share button, what I really like, is you can either share your whole screen or individual windows. So if you want to just share the news article while you're pulling up your data collection on the, the window next to it, I, I love that, that you can do that without. Mm-hmm. That is a nice option. Now, yeah. I, was, I was talking to the Expressible crew, and they said that the free version of Zoom is not HIPAA compliant. But the paid version is. Gotcha. That makes sense, though. They're going to yeah. I mean, differentiate it somehow. Right. And exactly. then also um, the Expressible crew, and I forget what it is, so I will try to put the link into the show notes. Um, they use a different, uh, like, telepractice software. And it's only like $12 a month or something like that, or $12 a year. And it is HIPAA okay. compliant. So then, you know, after this, Mike, if you want to offer telepractice service, telepractice services, and you don't want to hook up with a company like Expressible or one of our other friends of the podcast, you could do it yourself. That's right. There you go. Or you could do the Zoom one. I think it's like 40 bucks a month or something. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's one therapy session. Yeah, there you go. But... No, I, you know, I, I, I feel like you're right, Mike. I think the telepractice success stories we're going to find out of this is that we are all going to grow as therapists. Mm-hmm. I really and think I, you're right. It makes me wonder if when all of this does eventually phase out, right, and we're back to being in brick and mortar buildings and in person, if there, we're going to see more of a blend of therapy. Mm-hmm. You know, incorporating more of either check-ins through teletherapy or not always coming to the clinic. One in the clinic, one via teletherapy. I could see that morphing as people see positives and negatives of both. I could see that. So... All right. Well, we want to hear from you. Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. Email us, speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com, or give us a phone call or a text message, 614-681-1798. I just found out that I can answer text messages through the Google voice chat. Look at that. Uh, so it's, it's amazing how tech savvy we're all getting. <laughs> So if all three We've of us only download been using Zoom for how many years? If all three of us download the Google Voice, you can send any of us text messages and we can answer you right away. 614-681-1798. Please text message us. We are in quarantine until April 30th. We want interaction. We want social right? It says physical distancing, not social distancing. Good distinction. So, all right. So every week we try to find something good that Asha is doing for us because it is very easy to get very angry and upset about the 400 and something dues that they are the 400 something dollars in dues that they charge us and go, what are they giving us for our money? And Michelle, I think you even posted about it this week, but Mike, you did as well. Uh, They've got a wonderful COVID side, but what are they offering for free uh, until June? I believe. I believe the end it's of June. Yeah, learning it's actually, pass, right? Yep, it's a learning pass to the new because they're offering a subscription-based CEUs through ASHA now. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of ASHA members were like, why isn't this included? Well, it's not included forever, but it is included till the end of June. All you have to do, and it's going to be automatically, if you don't enroll now, I believe as of today or the last couple of days, you'll be auto-enrolled as an ASHA member. Oh, really? Uh, for it so you have access to free asha ceus through asha um, until the end of june so at least during this school calendar year the rest of the kind of school year you can or if you're quarantined and unable to work a little bit right now knock out some of those ceu hours yeah, I need to start doing that during my I I got to come up with a better schedule I think for the stay at home to flatten the curve next three weeks, four weeks. Cause right now I'm at just least, say what? 
I don't know. Just make yourself an outline. Don't yeah. don't over schedule it. Just make a <laughs> no, no, no. And like uh, you know, Angie Merced last week said that we need to schedule free time. Like literally, mm-hmm. just says from three to five, I'm playing video games with my kids. Um, but like, you know, I'm sleeping until like eight or nine if I don't have a meeting and I've got meetings this week at seven 30 in the morning. So whatever. But like, I, I need to get on a back to work schedule instead of this. I can get it done all day schedule. All right. <laughs> Share your schedule with us once you get it, Matt. All right. I will. Oh, all right. So that is our <laughs> Asha spotlight. They are, they are it, the free CEUs. That is always a nice thing. So, hey. Yeah, and they're doing it because of the quarantine and yeah, and I saw Asha really marketing this learning pass pretty hard before Mm -hmm. any of this COVID thing happened. So they were clearly, you know, on their end, they were clearly hoping to make a good amount of money off of this. You know, having people sign up for this, and you know, it was a nice source of income for them. So for them, and the other note is any current subscribers. So say you've already subscribed to the Asha Learning Pass. They are extending those subscriptions by three months at no cost. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's nice. Look at that. Yep. So you will have that benefit for three months past whatever your subscription was. Well, look yeah. at that. And if you go right onto asha.org, the first thing you'll see is a big uh, red square, and they have a lot of really good information about telepractice. You click right on telepractice, right from the main page, and they have uh, evidence-based information you can send to families, list of resources uh they really have some really good stuff on there because they pretty much see what everyone's headed towards now the last segment that we do in this show is the wonderful hot take the ss pod hot take where one of us gets on a soapbox and gets a moment to blast whatever and i'd like to make a suggestion for this week for the next couple of weeks and i would like a vote lot live to tape here uh, I vote that we suspend the hot take for the next couple of weeks because there is already so much negativity that maybe we don't need to add to that negativity. Why does it have to be negative? Why can't it be a positive hot take? Oh, because I'm a very negative person, evidently. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't have a positive hot take. Do you? I have a positive hot take. Okay. It's like a shout out, but it's not for an SLP. Go for it. That's perfect. It's a positive Mike, hot I take, love this so... idea, by the way. Thank you. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> good, good looking out. We do um, talk to each other before the show starts, just like for moments, though. All right, Michelle, what's your positive hot take? <laughs> My positive hot take is people going out of their way to, as you said, not social distance, but physical distance. Mm -hmm. So finding ways to connect with each other. So for example, in our neighborhood, somebody a street away, a block away posted on either the lamppost or the trees all the way around a whole block, all the pages from the going on a bear hunt story, and then sent out information to ask people to put up teddy bears in their windows to go on a bear hunt, to go look for things. And so I've seen this pop up on social media as well of not just a bear hunt, but this is a way to do an Easter egg hunt, like put different Easter eggs up in your windows so kids can walk the neighborhood and find Easter eggs and putting rainbow pictures in the windows on St. Patrick's Day. People put shamrocks up in different neighborhoods. And I just want to give a hot take, positive hot take to that because finding ways, especially for our kids to get outside to, you know, look and find it's educational too. Um, the language stuff that you can do with that. Come on, guys. That's awesome. And also just feeling connected so you're not alone in all this. True. I like it. My wife put a Stormtrooper and Kylo Ren in the top middle window of our house. That's perfect. I'm just going to start rotating out the items that are in our windows. Oh, I like that. We want to hear from you. Head over to our website, speech science podcast at or speech science podcast.com. Email us speech science podcast at gmail.com or give us a phone call or text message 614 681 1798. All right, let's send this thing home. Michael, what are you doing this week? Let's go non therapy related. What is something you are looking forward to this week? Um, I've been doing a lot of like, uh, like workout videos. Like in Philadelphia, I don't know if this is everywhere else, but we have this thing called Class Pass. So you do like uh, you type in Class Pass. You can you can like like do like different high intensity interval training videos. 
Uh, so I've been working out uh, here in this room here that, I, that I'm currently in, where I also do my teletherapy. Nice. So I'm doing a lot of, as opposed to going to the gym or going outside and running, I've been doing these videos and they're awesome. I love them. It's a great workout. I did yoga today. Uh, it was really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Michelle, what are you looking forward to this week that is not therapy related? I mean, it's kind of similar to Mike, but honestly, the weather is looking up and being outside as much as I can while still maintaining the appropriate distance from other people. But, um, <laughs> um, but <laughs> for real, we went on a four or five mile walk today and around a lake and it just was so nice to be outside and have some sunshine and some family time. That's great. I am looking forward to finishing Harley Quinn. I am looking forward to, which is a awesome cartoon, but no one should watch that with their children. Uh, <laughs> I am looking forward to finishing Tiger King and as well, uh, some warmer weather to get my son riding a bike. We're going to use this time productively and get him riding his bike independently. And Mike, don't shake your head at the Tiger King thing. Have you seen the Tiger King memes? Yes, I have. I'm sure there's some there's hilarious some ones. Hilarious. Uh, okay, so the thing I couldn't figure out was like just how okay. If you have not, we're listened, going back to Tiger. If King. you have you not are, listened, you guys if, are taking over the podcast. If you have with not Tiger seen Sp uh, Tiger King, fast forward thirty seconds because this have is a spoiler. This what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you have not seen Tiger King, skip ahead 30 seconds because this is a spoiler. And Michelle, you may want to take your headphones off if you want to do this off. one. Here we go. Is Mike, I couldn't believe how calm he was after Ketch or Kef or whatever her name was, Seth, had her arm ripped off. And he just walks in and goes, I want you all to hear about it now. Uh, instead of hearing it on the news, someone had their arm ripped off and I'll give you your money back or you can have a rain check to come back. Have a good day. And then that lady whose arm got ripped off <laughs> went went back to work like five days right. later. And she was like, yeah, I'd rather have it just uh, cut off completely amputated versus uh, being in the news any longer. So, Yeah. Sometimes I think about w what my life was like before I watched Tiger King and Simple. how happy I was. <laughs> Oh, now we can let Michelle come back in. It's good. We are good. Giving her the <laughs> thumbs up. That is our Tiger King update for the week. If I ever decide to watch it, I will be glad that I didn't. Right. Miss but you have to remember spoiler. this when you go to listen to this episode. Not to yeah, just... I'm not going to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I once you start to... talking about Tiger King again, I'm just going to finish the episode. <laughs> no, don't do that. You got to listen to the whole thing. Or not. Don't listen to the whole thing. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to stall for something, and I apologize. I'm going to cut this out. I hope so, because this is Keep it in. Keep dead it in. air. Keep no, in I'm trying air. to find all the music that we have to do. Oh, I should just do this. <laughs> oh, where's it at? Think of all the dead air people have in their teletherapy session, so they need to know that we do it, too. Right? Like... That's the thing I was thinking about the other day is like how much I hate dead air. And then like, you're going to have so much dead air and dead space, like doing mm -hmm. this. Yeah. I, I, I got sick or not got sick, but I was like trying not to get like dizzy watching the zoo do all their stuff on like a handheld phone and dragging it through and all the weird hissing and breathing noises and stuff like that. Are you leaving this in? I think so, but I'm still scrolling to find the, <laughs> the the credits that I have to do. Leave I thought in. they'd be memorized by now. I think I, I could do some of them. It's the new show. It's the new music that I don't have yet. Gotcha. And I can't find it, guys. How about this be the closing? No, we have to do the the <laughs> I know the music. Good. Be a willow. That's the closing. Yeah, be a no. willow. Oh, hang on. I'm almost there. And found it all right our opening music is please listen carefully by jazard's license under an attribution and share like license our boat music is the county fair rock copyrighted john deku find all of his music at soundcloud.com slash dirt dog music the informed slp's music was at the count by broke for free 
That's licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. And our closing music, which is playing right now, it's Slow Burn by Kevin McLeod. It's licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. In the immortal words of Janice Wright, always be a willow more now than ever. Uh, the oak looks strong, but it will break under pressure. The willow will bend and then return to form. For Dueling Willows, Michelle Wintering, Michael McLeod, I'm Matt Hot. Until next week, so long, everybody. This has been an Exceptional Podcast Network production. Speech Science is edited and produced by MWH Production. Please follow Speech Science on Twitter at SpeechSciencePC and like our page on Facebook. For more original podcasts, please visit ExceptionalEd.com and rate and subscribe to our podcast anywhere you get your podcasts.